You're listening to the Utah Checkdown Podcast. And now your hosts, Josh Furlong and Josh Newman. Welcome back to another edition of the Utah Checkdown Podcast. I'm Josh Furlong, joined uh, joined with my co-host, Josh Newman. What's up, Josh? How are you today? How are we doing? Two weeks out from the opener, and as we were just kind of uh, lamenting offline, we we kind of want some football to cover here, but uh, not you know not quite yet. Hey, on the one hand, we don't have to talk about the Big Twelve this week, so uh, I mean, maybe it, maybe it comes into the we, conversation. We could, we could, <laughs> but we don't have to. That's true. We'll devote the whole first uh, thirty minutes to the Big Twelve again. <laughs> oh wait, bit wait. Nelly will be performing at the the championship game this year. So, what year is it? <laughs> Two thousand five. <laughs> <laughs> well played, sir. There you go. No, we got we got real football ish ish yeah. to talk about now. So yeah, uh, let's let's jump in. Um, since our last podcast, so we're doing this Thursday night. Uh, we're doing a little later than normal. So for those that are are used to listening to this at a uh, earlier hour now you get to go a little bit later but uh uh the last time we talked uh we came off the last scrimmage uh we were talking about a little things what needed to happen we got some updates there uh one of the biggest updates and this happened over the weekend we found out that brandon rose suffered an injury in their their uh first scrimmage um, yep. we don't know fully the extent of his injury other than the fact that he reportedly had to go to the hospital based on what he said on instagram and there were right. some other things there so um, Brandon Rose, who was in a battle for QB two slash QB one because Cam hasn't been cleared yet, uh, goes down with injury, and we're left now with Bryson Barnes and Nate Johnson. But in your eyes, does this Brandon Rose have any injury? Like his injury, does it have any impact starting off? Or, or I, I think the last time we talked, Bryson Barnes had already kind of taken the QB two spot at least temporarily. So, in your eyes, does this actually have an, an impact on the team right now? Yeah, I mean, it does have an impact just because your your quarterback room was already a little thin, right? You know, between Cam rising. Look, let's start there. Like, your starting quarterback is sure. injured and rehabbing and recovering, and there is no promise that your number one guy will get all the way back for the opener, right? That's been the overarching thing here from the winter into the spring into the summer. That's first. Behind rising, your options are – I don't want to say limited, but your options are just really green. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like we've seen Bryson Barnes here. You know, we know what he did against Washington state last year, the Rose bowl. Fine. He doesn't have a ton of experience and he certainly does not have a ton of experience playing against a defense like Florida or a team or a defense that will bring as much athleticism as Florida will. So you've got rising, you've got Barnes, Brandon Rose has never taken a collegiate snap, right? He ran the scout team for the final 75% of last season. And Nate Johnson, look, we saw bits and pieces. We saw what he's capable of. One career pass attempt, Josh. Okay, so does the Brandon Rose thing have, you know, a lot, you know, does it carry a lot of weight, this injury? I mean, yeah, because your room was already thin. There were already enough question marks. You take Rose out of, out of the mix for what I presume to be weeks, if not months, right, dealing with this injury. What are you supposed to do? You know, Bryson Barnes has kind of become kind of this lightning rod, right? This polarizing figure, at least among fans who they've seen enough of Bryson Barnes and they want to see what Nate Johnson can do, right? And you see a lot of people are kind of like yelling to, you know, dump more reps into Nate Johnson and let's see what Nate Johnson can do. And let me just say, like, this is not, this is not high school, right? Where you're moving up the JV kid to take yeah. varsity reps as a sophomore, right? I'll, I'll use that analogy. This is not the NFL where you are tanking for a draft pick. This is college football. And in college football, as Kyle Whittingham has said many times, right, in college football, like the guy who gives you the best chance to win is going to play. There's no favorites. There's no this, that. The guy who gives you the best chance to win is going to play. Now, if Cam – does not get all the way back by August 31st. He's out. Brandon Rose is out. As we're sitting here now on August 17th, Bryson Barnes probably gives you the best chance to win, mm -hmm. more so than Nate Johnson. Now, that's 
Now, as I've alluded to in the past on this podcast and, and stuff I've written, that's kind of a whole nother subject to me. Like, why is Bryson Barnes remaining in this QB2 position? Why hasn't anybody been able to overtake him? That's a whole different topic. We, and we can talk about that later in the show. But like right now, as we're sitting here, you know, look, they scrimmaged again for the second time today, Thursday. Yeah. So we'll, you know, so we'll see what happened there. You know, we'll get some assistant coaches talking to us tomorrow uh friday it sounds like kyle whittingham kind of sort of out of nowhere will talk to us again next week but as we're sitting here now with that second scrimmage having taken place today we don't know every last detail of it yet as we're sitting here now if it's not rising bryson barnes gives you the best chance to win a football game on august 31st and 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 that's the reason why i probably say that this brandon rose injury doesn't necessarily have a huge impact right now right like i think in terms of depth and and the ability to ability to be able to just work with guys that were doing well brandon obviously won the battle in spring he was coming into it as the presumptive starter should cam you know not be available so, so i think from that respect it hurts but at the end of the day i think bryson barnes has done enough he's he you know he's working his butt off as a walk on kid for know, sure for the for, for sure. the fact that he's been uh you know a, a, a qb in the system as qb2 we should say you know the fact that he's a walk on still hasn't gotten a scholarship and he's still doing this and beating it out there's there's something there right like and i think yeah. like i i don't know as journalists, we're supposed to be skeptical, right? I think that's our job is to kind of yes. be skeptical mm-hmm. of the things, not just take things at face value. But there, there come, there's this one little thing that keeps nagging at me, and it, it's Andy Ludwig loves Bryson Barnes. Now, yes. he, he sees him. He's the one that works with him the most, and he's the one that you know has the ability to be able to diagnose what's going on. You and I sitting here today on a Thursday night literally have no idea, right? Like we've seen Bryson Barnes – uh, in a few games and, and obviously none of those games have been schemed towards him. It hasn't, the game plan hasn't been built around him. Yeah. And so I think there's, there's some difference there, but it, it is crazy to me that, you know, Brandon Rose comes into fall essentially as the presumptive QB two, we all kind of expected that to happen. And then Bryson continues to beat it out. And, and, and for me, like, I wonder if this is a scenario where, you know, Bryson isn't necessarily going to, lose you the game, right? I mean, he can. I'm not saying he can't, but I think he's more of a game manager. He's going to control the system. He understands the system, having been here for three years, understanding what Andy Ludwig likes. You know, this this is a an area where he understands it better than anybody. And, you know, th- the crazy thing is, is, like, he has probably arguably one of the best passes we've ever seen from a quarterback last year, <laughs> which, which is crazy. That, like, that throw at Washington State still is probably one of the best throws of, of yeah. the best season so i think you know he has the capability right i think he can do it and it, it, i'm curious to see if kyle or andy are going to going to let him air it out a little bit or if utah plays it safe are they going to you know try to manage the expectations and that's why you're not worrying about nate johnson nate johnson obviously has a lot of high-end talent in terms of his dual threat capabilities but he hasn't we've seen one collegiate pass and and based on kyle's comments it doesn't sound like Nate is making the progress throwing that he needs to. He's not as accurate, right? He's, he's a little bit right. more indecisive at the pocket. That's not to say he can't be there, right? I, I still think there comes a time where Nate Johnson should slash can beat out Bryson Barnes, but I just don't think we're to that yet. And so the best safe option is probably Bryson Barnes. Right. And, you know, you, you, you know, you use the word or the term safe option, and that's not what a lot of fans want to hear. They don't want the safe option, no. right? They want the, you know, the dynamic, athletic, electric option, right? With oh, Nate Johnson, does, who right? doesn't though, right? Like, I mean, that's, of that's course, the like, of football. Nate Johnson scored touchdowns on his first two collegiate touches last year. Like people got excited and with good reason. But, you know, I, um, I really, really hate the term game manager because I think it comes with a negative connotation. Um, I, I think for a little while, a couple of years ago, earlier in his career, I think game manager got attached to Cam Rising a little bit, at least early in the 21 season. You know, the, they kind of leaned on the running game, and, you know, Keithy was a security blanket, and, you know, and Dalton Kincaid had a breakout year in that 21 season. And, like, that got – that, that like, game manager tag was, like, attached to Rising. And, of course, he – I don't want to say overcame that, but he moved beyond just being viewed as a game manager. But, like, Bryson Barnes – for as much as I don't like that term, he is more of a game manager. And that's, you know, look, he, he's not the most athletic guy in the field and he's not the most 
hey, count. You had one of the fastest times for as one of their runners. I, so I'm, I'm just telling I, you, you're you're I wrong. I understand. <laughs> I'm wrong. Um, you know, I look. I I I don't want to like turn this into like a negative topic or like a negative subject. But like the fact remains, like Bryson Barnes does not have the biggest arm, and he's not. You know, he doesn't do all the things that rising does but he can manage a game and i've said like for a while now even going back to the spring like if it's not going to be rising i really i really did think that utah could beat florida if it was brandon rose but you would need help right you would need the offensive line to show up and you would need jaquindon jackson to look like what people think he could be and you need the defensive backfield to make plays and you know don't put everything on Brandon Rose. And, like, you, you know, it's kind of the same thing now. Take Rose out, put Bryson Barnes into this subject. You can beat Florida with Bryson Barnes, but everybody has to show up. Like, Bryson, you don't want Bryson Barnes throwing the ball 40 times. If Utah falls behind double digits, 10 points, 14 points, Bryson Barnes is not built to sling the ball all over the place and throw for 350 and like, and, you know, and come back the way that rising did last year in both USC games. So this is not an ideal situation. Um, if Barnes has to start this game, but I, I would not call it dire. This is not a dire situation. Um, I don't think things start getting dire here until rising can't play against like UCLA. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like if, if we get to the point where, Okay, he's not ready for Florida. He's not ready for Baylor. All right, fine. Not ideal. But if you're not ready for Pac twelve play, it's a thing. I don't I don't know that I don't know that Bryson Barnes can win you a Pac twelve championship. Actually, I, I'm pretty positive that there's just not enough there with Barnes where he can go seven and two against the Pac twelve and walk into USC and walk into Washington. And I don't mean that as a knock on Bryson Barnes. I, I feel like that is like a matter of fact type of type of thing to me that he he's just he is what he is and that's not a bad thing but he's not going to lead you to where this program thinks it can go again this fall so bryson barnes will not be stetson bennett right he's not going to be that that walk on quarterback that wins the job and then goes win two uh, national championships. no but I, I i agree with you and i and and i'm to the point now you know i mean we've been we've been ruminating on this for ever right i mean since cam got injured i think that was one of the first things you and i actually talked about at the rose bowl uh, was mm-hmm. the timeline uh you know who is going to back him up, obviously that stuff um but i, I i'm kind of getting to the point where i think even if cam's ready why put him in right like save him for conference play now i understand that that comes with a lot of risk and a lot of of issues in that respect but to me you know conference play is what's going to matter I, I i really don't think you know, we can we can entertain playoffs and we can talk about that. And I do I think that if Utah were to win with this schedule, one they should be considered one hundred percent, right? Like sure. it's a great schedule and they've got it. Can't do they have the talent and the ability? Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I just don't think that's going to be in their cards. And I don't think that anybody's ever really talking about that. And so for me, your your main objective is to go for that that three peat, right? You're trying to get the, another conference championship, the the last Pac twelve championship that we think is going to happen. And so for that reason, you know, limit Cam's impact on the field in the sense of, of don't put him in a situation where he can get injured in one of those games against physical teams. Florida's probably more physical than Baylor. Baylor maybe is improved. We don't know. We'll find out. Yeah. But but like there's it's too too much risk, especially if you're clearing him. We're at 14 days. We're we're literally two weeks. This time in two weeks, you and I are going to be sitting in Rice Echo Stadium watching Florida. We'll know the quarterback. Everything's happening at that point. Right. And I just I just don't know if Cam is the best option right now. He's the best option in terms of the play. I just don't think he's the best option for the longevity of this season. A couple of things. I mean, you know, I do I do I respectfully disagree with your very valid point. Like there is an argument to be made that you want to save him for Pac-12 play because ultimately that's probably going to be what the reasonable attainable goal is. But if he's ready, Okay, look, we're two weeks out, and we'll get to that in a second. But mm-hmm. when he's ready, he's playing. Like you're not right. going to have him. You're not going to have him at 100 percent or ready to go slash 100 percent and leave him sitting there because, as we said previously, if you know a a 100 percent healthy rising is your best option, and you are not leaving your best option sitting there. The argument for 
saving him for UCLA on September 23rd. Why are we discounting the college football playoff? Like, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say that like Utah is the Pac-12 favorite. I don't think they're the Pac-12 favorite, but like, if you beat Florida and you beat Baylor, everything's on the table. Oh, absolutely. And we can talk about, and we can talk about, you know, the Pac-12 is weird and wonky, and they'll, you know, they'll drop a clunker because it's the Pac-12 and the schedule. You have to go to USC, you have to go to Washington, you have to go to Oregon State. There's all these potholes. Fine, but for now. What is in front of you is if you win the first two, let's assume a, a win over Weber State, everything's on the table. <laughs> <We'll assume. laughs> Sorry for your alma mater, but whatever. Um, so that's where we are. I mean, don't, you know, don't discount the college football playoff just yet. And if and when rising is cleared and, and greenlit and healthy, he's playing. Like, I don't think you're sitting him, saving him. Now, you and I have made a, a lot about the timeline. Right, mm-hmm. going all the way back to the Rose Bowl, right? Like we were talking like on the bus back, on the media bus back, going back to the hotel. Timeline, it's January 2nd, ACL. You're talking like eight, nine months. What are the options behind Ryzen? Fine. We're sitting here now two weeks from the opener. Kyle Whittingham has said that he is willing to wait up to one week before the opener to see Rising healthy, right? That timeline was originally needs to see Rising like 10 to 14 days. He, Kyle's alluded to now, okay, I'm, I'm willing to wait up to seven days. So let me get your opinion on this. Okay. We are now two weeks from the opener. Okay. You have scrimmaged twice. Okay. For all intents and purposes, I think they probably know at this point what they're looking at with rising available, not available. Can they get him ramped up still? At what point do you have to really start to, get a game plan ready for Bryson Barnes and really get Bryson Barnes ready to go. It, is it now? Do you have four days? Do you have seven days? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I've, I've heard, and I don't know if this is true. I've heard this week was a big week for cam in terms of, mm. of checking. Right. Um, yeah. I don't know that for certain. Um, but at the same time, if he didn't get the clearance this week, I feel like you have to kind of lean into the, into Bryson Barnes starting, right. The and word so on I, the street was they needed to like, if, if rising was going to be ready, you needed to get the ramp up going this week. That's what I heard. Exactly. Anyway, exactly. Yeah. And so like, like you mentioned, there's still seven days and, and, and I trust cam, you know, with all of his experience to be able to step in, let's say, you know, he can be cleared Saturday, Monday, whatever day you want before that Florida game. I think they can do it. The, the issue is, is that, is that time period. Right. And so I think yeah. you are getting to that time where they, they have to have a good understanding, right? You, you either know, Hey, this is close. We we think he can get cleared on Monday, or this is a scenario where you know what we don't think he's going to be clear. I, I I can't imagine that they don't have a good understanding right now. Like what's going sure. to change in weeks time, right? And so for me, like at this point, if he's not cleared, Bryson Barnes is your number one guy in your head. That's what you're going with, and maybe that's what they've been going with this entire time, right? Like Kyle's you know going to be a little diplomatic about it, and and he's not going to give the full full details simply right. because he right. has to keep sort of guessing. But now becomes Bryson Barnes territory, right? Now you're scheming it towards him. What can we do? What can we do to help him in this offense? You know, do we do we run the ball a little bit more? Do we um, do we load the box with more tight ends to be able to have a few more options to him? You know, th- that's where I think you've got to start scheming. And we're we're probably not going to get a lot of those details because you know maybe from the assistant coaches tomorrow we'll be able to get something. Maybe Andy Ludwig is in a talkative mood tomorrow. Uh, depends on what mood we get, but um, maybe we hear something from him where he gives us a little bit more detail. But but I I think that's where you have to go. I think you have to now start planning for Bryson, and then if you need to switch it to Cam, I don't think that that's a huge shift, right? Like I no, think no, th- no, this no. team is is veteran enough that they're okay. And and to that point, you now have a veteran offensive line. You've got guys that are in theory better than they've ever been for Utah, and so I think you've got the ability to be able to do a lot of things. It's really just a matter of who's under center and and kind of how that game plan uh, unveils itself. So, I, I still, you know, if if I was a betting man, I'd bet that Bryson Barnes is your starter, you know, in two yeah. weeks. Um, and mm-hmm. I think that's how it's going to be. But, you know, I don't know. It, what what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I would agree with you. I mean, I am a betting man, but I live in Utah now, so there's less of that. Just kidding. They're still um, Wendover. They're still <laughs> could go to Wendover. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I you know sitting here like two weeks until the opener, like kind of knowing what 
you, I, we know kind of behind the scenes talking to people. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, Bryson Barnes is probably, probably like the betting favorite to start the opener at this point. Um, you know, rising is probably like even money, like still on the board. Like that's still a possibility that's not being ruled out. You know, I was listening to you just now make your point about, you know, Barnes and, and getting him ready and, and scheming towards him. And I do remember at one point, this was like early in the spring, uh, rising was obviously not available. And, you know, the QB two competition was kind of unfolding between Rose Barnes and Nate Johnson. And we got Andy Ludwig one day, the media during spring. And somebody asked smartly, somebody asked like, do you have to cater your offense to who your quarterback is. Cause obviously, you know, rising has, you know, inside and out intimate knowledge of, of the offense. He's, he's been working with Andy Ludwig. This is year five for cam with Andy Ludwig. Yes. Um, five. Right. So, so yeah, somebody asked like, do you have to alter your plan based on your quarterback? And he very adamantly said, no. And I'm paraphrasing here, but this is the offense. This is what we're teaching. This is what we're installing. And we trust that everybody in the room will have command of the offense that we're installing. Now, that's fine. But, of course, I would think that your your play calling for Rising would be different than your play calling for Bryson Barnes. Like, when Rising is in there and, and, and healthy, they were calling last season, you know, whatever, 8, 10, 12 designed keepers for Rising. I don't know that you're going to do that with Bryson Barnes, but you know, the point being, it's like, I don't think you're going to see like major radical wholesale changes to uh, Ludwig's scheme, but I do think you would see, I don't know, like a major departure in play calling between rising and Barnes, but I think you would see like a pretty noticeable difference between what Ludwig would call for rising versus what Ludwig would, would call for Bryson Barnes. And and maybe this gets us to a different point, but based on on the guys that you have in a running back room, right? Like you've got at least four guys that are are proven guys that have at least had some experience there. Yeah. Is, is this a scenario where you just lean on that, where you just say, you know what, we're going to run every single down. Okay. Within reason, like I get it, right. You can't do that. Yes. But do you just turn it into that and say, hey, we're going to we're going to beat Florida into the ground with our, our run game? You know, if if that doesn't work, then we kind of start opening it up. Or do you feel like you have to kind of keep that balanced? Right. Like, do you feel like it has to still be balanced, still try to see what Bryson can do? Or do you eliminate the risk by keeping it in the hands of, of your proven running backs? Yeah. You know, I think that maybe depends on how the game is playing out. And, you know, who gets the rock first and just what is the tempo? What is the tone of the game? Um, again, I don't think you want Bryson Barnes slinging it all over the place. Um, and you're right. There are some proven options in that Utah running back room. Um, you know, I'm a little more bearish on Jaquindon Jackson than others. I'd like to see some more before I anoint him as, you know, the next guy. Um, Chris Curry's coming off an injury. That's a bit of an X factor. Um, Makai Bernard's going to be huge in this game. Uh, huge. Uh, he's healthy. Uh, you know, I've been hearing that he's, you know, he's looked good. He's looked spry. He's looked like himself, you know, away from all the injuries. Makai Bernard is, is potentially, you know, if you eliminate Brand Keithy, if Brand Keithy plays, Makai Bernard might be your most important weapon because uh, obviously a running back, um, but he's excellent in pass pro and he can, he can catch the ball out of the backfield. And he can be something of a security blanket, you know, for Bryson Barnes, right? Again, all of this kind of depends on the tone of the game. But to your point, I mean, yeah, you know, with a veteran offensive line, if you are winning up front early, and yeah, if Jaquindon Jackson is running for five yards here and seven yards there, and, you know, you're running the ball at like five and a half yards a clip, and you're putting, um, and you're putting Barnes in situations where he's, you know, second and manageable, third and three, third and two and a half, like that's good. Like that's excellent. So uh, I don't pretend to be a football coach, but it would seem, it would seem pretty rational. It would seem pretty, I don't want to say obvious, but it would seem pretty reasonable that it's like, yeah, when you have this quarterback situation, don't put it all on his shoulders. You don't want him trying to sl sling it all over the place. If you can establish the run early and, you know, get again, get your quarterback in good positions, like second and four, third and short, 
that bodes well for Utah, I would think. Yeah, and I agree. And I and obviously you can't run the ball every time, right? Like we we understand that. We've watched enough football games and barring Florida just having no answer for the game. I mean, we saw Michigan do that to Ohio State last year where they just kept running it and running it and running it and yeah. Ohio State had no answer. So, I'm not saying that that's not a, a possibility and maybe maybe you get these guys each breaking off for some long touchdowns, who knows. But but I think the difference here is, is you have a running back room that in my estimation is going to be improved. And the one reason for that is no Tavion Thomas. Now we can we can get into that discussion if we want. Uh, I don't think we need to, um, but let's just say that Tavion Thomas provided a, a massive distraction. Um, there was a lot of things that were let, you know, people let him slide, and that those people aren't in this this uh, program anymore. Um, but you know, Quinton Ganther comes in, and he's he's got a room that they all demand respect, right? Like they respect yeah. him, he respects them, but they also are are all like accountable to each other. And so now you have a room that, that there's a lot more buy-in, there's a lot more camaraderie, there's a lot more love for each other, that they come in and they can they can do a lot of things here. Will that translate onto the field? I'm not saying that, that all of a sudden because you love each other, you're you know, you're going to war with your brothers, that type of thing, that that's gonna translate to you know extra yards or touchdowns. But I think you know, you already had decent enough success last year. It wasn't it wasn't what we're used to seeing out of Utah, but you've had decent enough success that if you can replicate that that's going to be a major strength for you, right? Like we've always talked about in you know, the last few years, the wide receivers need to be able to have more influence in this game and, and that yeah. doesn't change. And I think if anything, that probably helps this area a little bit more. But I think if you've got proven weapons there, especially at the beginning of the game, just own it, right? Just take it yeah. until Florida takes it away from you and then and then adjust, right? And and look, I don't get paid to be an offensive coordinator. I, I'm willing to take the shot. You can fire me after I fail horribly, but I'll take the money and sit there. <laughs> but uh, this is a scenario where, like, I, I, I honestly think, like, this is the easiest path to be able to help Utah in their quarterback situation. And me saying that means that Utah is going to come out there with four designed runs on the first drive for Bryson Barnes, and uh, no running back will touch the ball, and that's how we're right. going to go. Micah Pittman is going to yeah. score a touchdown. You know, I mean, that's, that's right. How it, for right? sure. I don't know. Yeah, no. Um, Interesting situation. I mean, you were very PC there getting into the Tavion stuff, but you know, the, the Tavion stuff, especially like down the stretch last year, just was not helping the cause and it was a distraction. And yeah, you could probably call the running back room, you know, fractured, you know, by the end of that thing. Um, Jaquindon Jackson, Makai Bernard and Chris Curry, all older guys, you know, mature guys, uh, guys who are in year, you know, three, four of this program, not year three or four under Quinton Ganther, but year three or four under Kyle Whittingham and in the system and understanding what Ludwig wants. And yeah, who knows if that all translates to the field, but that those things can't hurt. Okay. And, you know, Jalen Glover, still a young guy, um, ups and downs last year, hot and cold, mature kid you know, very mature kid who wants to be there, who wants to be part of the solution, wants to be part of the winning. So yeah, you know, the running back room is probably in a better place than it's been in a while. Um, And we'll see, you know, that's obviously, it's a huge factor. It's a huge, huge factor in what's going to go on here in two weeks if, if rising cannot go. And uh, I don't know, just like, you remember, you remember the run up to last year's Utah Florida game and how it was like every day for nine months, like we were talking about it and just every day. That's what this game, this game has not been nine months, but like it's kind of turning into that since mm-hmm. camp started. There's like one thing after the other, after the other, and the quarterback and rising and just it's turning into like an every day, every minute type of thing. And just like from a, from a media standpoint, from like a journalism standpoint, like I'm just like, let's play this game and like, we'll see what's what for better or worse. And then everybody can just move on. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that's everybody, right? I think the players are done hitting each other. They're tired of, uh, of having the same system where they're doing drills and everything. Like sure. we're all kind of in yeah. that. Right. Um, and you know, the, the one dynamic this year, uh, kind of shifting scales a little bit is is Utah's been really physical in their practices this year, and maybe probably yeah. more so than they have in years past. And I think that Florida game last year is a reason why they got exposed last year. Their defense was not up to snuff. 
Uh, they they really had some problems, missed tackles, missed assignments. You know, right. it, it wasn't a scenario where going into the swamp they weren't prepared. It was a matter of their team just looking lost, and so that really hurt them. But as part of that, you know, Utah's been really physical this this fall camp. Hence, Brandon Rose being live. You know, he he gets injured yeah. and all that other stuff. But you're starting to see a little bit more nicks and and, and you know bruises and and everything on the team. You know, we we can't talk about injuries, but there are some guys that that are are banged up, and we can see it. It's noticeable. Um, yeah. It's it sounds like Utah isn't in a scenario scenario where they're in a lot of trouble. Um, but no. at the same time, you know this this has become a much more physical camp, which has you know two sides of the coin, right? You you obviously can get yourself banged up and and cause some injuries, but you're also allowing yourself to really go after guys. In your eyes. Do you think it's better to have a physical fall camp leading into camp, or do you think it's it's better to maybe lessen it up and kind of let the season ease on? It's a fine line. I mean, look, last year they did not go live a ton. They were not very physical in camp last year. And, yeah, like you saw kind of the result of that in Florida, right? I think it was 27 missed tackles, right? The the 45-yard touchdown run from Anthony Richardson was a, you know, a, a, a – a terrible blown assignment. So when you don't have a physical camp, those types of mistakes, those types of shortcomings are going to, are going to rear their ugly head as they did. And now you are in a situation where, and I thought Kyle was really good on this. I think I asked him, you know, I asked him a pretty general question about, you know, his philosophy about like having quarterbacks live during camp. Cause you know, you don't see that everywhere and you don't see that very often. And his answer, you know, was essentially like, look, if you have young guys, who have not gotten a ton of reps, not just quarterbacks, but all over the field. If you have a lot of young guys and you just don't know what they're capable of because you haven't given them game reps yet, how are you supposed to judge them? How are you supposed to put them on the field when it matters unless you see what they do live? And just in the in the situation of Brandon Rose, you know, getting injured, yeah, I agree with Kyle. Like you had to have him live because never taking a collegiate snap. What's he going to do when the pass rush is coming? Mm -hmm. Is he going to keep plays alive? Is he, you know, you just don't know. So um, very fine line. I don't know that there's, you know, one, you know, obvious good answer. But as you alluded to, and again, the media does not watch practice. But once practice ends, we are going downstairs to the practice field for interviews. And you can at least scan the after practice scene, who's in pads, who's not. We were down there or no, I missed on Wednesday. I was there Tuesday with you and you're looking around the field and it's like, oh, you're in a boot. Yeah. And you have a club on your hand, not saying that these are serious injuries, but it, it needs to be mentioned. Like, yeah, guys are dinged up. Guys are nicked up. Like they've been going, you know, full throttle on, at least on days with pads since August 2nd or August 3rd or whatever. So um, yeah, very fine line, how you want to judge or how you want to go about your camp situation. But ultimately, like I probably agree with Kyle, you know, you don't really know what you have in some of these young guys until they're live and they're getting hit and how they react to getting hit. And if they can get up and, and do it again. Um, let me ask you this. If, if this opener in two weeks, if this opener was, you know, Weber or Utah tech or whatever, and not Florida an sec team, that's going to come in here and be physical. If it was somebody lesser, would you still want to be physical in camp knowing that the level of competition was not super high? No, I don't think so. I think you you yeah. ease into it a little bit. I think the you know the Weaver game, using that as an example, that is kind of your your live scrimmage, and and maybe you still go a little bit live. You're, you're certainly not putting your quarterbacks in a live scenario where they can be tackled. Right. But I, I I think it's 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 based on the opponent. You can't go into that Florida game, especially at home, being beaten you know in the trenches, right? And and you no. in the trenches and then their yeah. secondary got blown. You know, it, it it just came down to a scenario where they just couldn't do anything and by that point you can't stop it. Like Morgan Scally is not pulling him off to the side and saying tackle better. Like they know that. Right. Like they understand it. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think it it definitely depends on the opponent and and Utah over the last few years except for last year and this year, they've always kind of eased into that. They've had that cupcake game where they can kind of get into it get a right. higher level scrimmage going on where they can, you know, play an FCS team. And, but, but this is where Utah wants to be. They want to be able to play these teams. Now, how that changes moving forward with, you know, the way the college football playoffs are, are shaping up and conference realignment and everything that way, I think you're probably going to see a little bit of a different schedule that way. Um, yeah. I can't imagine that Kyle 
you know, Kyle slash whoever takes over. Maybe that's Morgan. I think we assume. Um, but I think that I don't, I don't think Utah is going to continue that route anymore unless they have to, because it's much easier to kind of ramp up this way. And I think you're seeing the impact of that, but on the same, on the same vein, if you are physical, you're ready to go. Right. And, and I think we're yeah. getting that understanding from this team. They're, they're angry. They're ready. They want to go, you know, they're tired of hitting each other and, and those injuries are going to pile up, but they're ready to go. And I think, you know, once Florida comes out, they're just going to release all that energy and, and, and at yeah. least have somebody else that they can hit. Yeah. You know, you bring up a good point about, uh, you know, scheduling in the future and what that might look like um, now that Utah is going into the big 12, um, you know, that was, that was a topic of conversation, like as realignment got ramped up like late July and it was a topic of conversation uh, that Monday, right. When Taylor Randall, the president of the university of Utah and the athletic director, Mark Harlan spoke to the media, you know, what does the scheduling look like now? You've got 10 brand new openings because you were, you were on the books for six BYU games and two against Houston and Baylor. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of holes to fill. And yeah, I would probably agree with you, you know, with the 12 team playoff and the way it's looking and just what the road, what the road to the 12 team playoff would look like. No, there's probably less of a need to schedule heavy early. Now, Mark Harlan has said, and again, this is like, my weirdo brain going where it doesn't need to go. Cause we're, we're like years down the road here, but like Mark Harlan has said in the past, he will, he will not start to uh, get out of contracts. That's just not something he's going to do. So these games like deep into the future, you know, they've got LSU on the books and they've got Wisconsin on the books, like 2031. They're just not going to get rid of those games. So those games are on the books and if Harlan were to leave at some point and somebody else takes over, what would that, what, what would that person's scheduling philosophy look like? Do you, you know, do you pay the fee to get out and schedule lighter? So um, this big 12 thing, obviously um, we weren't going to talk about the big 12, so you can blame me for this one, but um, the uh, everything with the big 12 going on, obviously this is all in its infancy, right? This is all brand new and there's a lot of moving parts and things to deal with. But I think one of the more fascinating parts is what do you do with the football schedule? Mm -hmm. uh, short term, long term, you know, you've got two games now, two openings now in 2024 because you had Baylor and BYU on the books. So you have to deal with that. You have an opening, I think two openings now in 25. So like, I'm curious, I'm curious if you try to like schedule light, do you try to schedule again, like a Weber, uh, you know, a Utah tech, another FCS program from the region, or do you look for, you know, a power five or a group of five with an opening? You know, I've done like some like very like cursory, nothing research. Like there's a lot of teams surprisingly with openings. So um, I'm as curious as anybody to see kind of where that stuff lands. And, and we're not going to know anything relatively soon. Uh, you know, this is, a, no. this is something where they're, they're working on this consistently. Uh, Mark Harlan is actually down in Dallas right now uh, with you know, different meetings that are going on. Um, yep. I, I would assume that these are going to be topics of conversation that they're going to be discussing and trying to figure out the the layout of the land because there's a lot of teams that have to all of a sudden change their schedules, not just in the Big 12. You've got Big 10, uh, Pac-12, Pac-4, whatever it is. There, there's going to yeah. be some scenarios there. So uh, this, you know, it, it's going to be a while, but I, this is the thing that, you know, it, it goes on later, right? The, the football season's now, and I think yeah. that's what we're most looking forward to. But um, before we, we transition out of football, because we have a couple more Utah-related things that I want to touch on. Uh, yep. Last Monday, the, the AP Top 25 poll was released. Utah falls at number – or not falls, but checks in at number 14, as well as the USA Today poll. We talked about that last week, but now we have the AP poll. We're just breaking stuff over there. <laughs> now no. my dog stood up. We're all good. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, but <laughs> we have the, the AP Top 25, you know, same teams from the Pac-12 are in it, essentially yeah. in the same spots, actually. Washington only moved up one spot to number 10, but Utah, Oregon, Oregon State, USC are all in the same spot. Nothing really different. I, I think there's a lot of uh, the same expectations going into this poll as there was the USA Today poll. Um, any any takeaways from now, the, the quote-unquote official poll until the college football playoff poll is released? No, I mean, not really. I mean, people wanted to make a – not a big deal, but a, a bit of a big deal that Alabama's ranked low, right? Yeah. Alabama's ranked low 
in the preseason poll. So, you know, that was like one thing that, that certainly caught my attention, but in terms of like PAC 12 stuff, I mean, not really. I mean, we can goof about the, you know, the coaches poll all we want and how, you know, Jordy Lindley or whoever filled out Kyle's, uh, Kyle's ballot. No, I, you know, I, I just put more credence into the AP poll. I, I think that I would like to think that the majority of the 60 some odd voters in the AP poll are like paying attention and they cover college football and they're invested and they're really trying to get it, you know, quote, right. You know, of course there is no right answer. I know that you take it seriously and really try to do the research and, and do the whole thing. So, um, no, I mean, no surprise. And, you know, Utah at 14, like, yeah, that's about the range that I think we thought going into the coach poll, right? Like 11 through 15, I think, <coughs> excuse me. I think the, I think the highest ranking Utah got in the AP poll, I think somebody had him in nine, eight or nine. So, yeah. um, yeah, so it, you know, it varies, you know, I think it was like eight through like 16 or 17. The preseason poll is tough because it's obviously, you know, it's part guesswork and it's part, what did you do last year and part, what do you have coming back? So it's not, it's not an easy endeavor to do an AP poll, especially in the preseason where all you have to go on is just a projection and, and looking backwards. Yeah. And I, you know, looking at all the voters, uh, they had Utah relatively locked in in the band of voters from 10 to uh, 16, I believe it was, you had a fairly yeah. consistent amount and it just shook out that way. Uh, Utah did get one lone vote at number 22. I, I don't get that one, but I also understand it at the same time if you have questions about Cam and, and the health. So, I, you know, this is preseason, right? Like like you said, I think this is this is something where, you know, we're making our best estimations based on what the available information we have from last year, you know, the talent that's been been put in. And I don't think there's a lot of people complaining about Utah 14. I think if anything, it's been nice for, for Utah fans to not feel like they have this massive target on their back. Um, they can come into this just kind of being the quote unquote underdog still, even though you're inside the top 15. Um, but it's, it's, it's a good spot for Utah. And I don't, I don't think that's anything to to knock and it's, it, you know, that's where they're going to be yeah. at the end of the day. I always, you know, I love this. I, you know, I get people <clears throat> complaining about my ballot all the time and, and you know, that's fine. And you're, you're more than welcome to criticize it. Um, because you know, my understanding at the time that I did it may shift or maybe I didn't think consider a point that you may have and i yeah. and i think that's interesting um but it's it's one of those things where it shakes out at the end right by the time we get down to it and by the time it ultimately matters it, it all kind of falls in place right we all understand okay these are the top five teams in the country you might have a debate on who's the fourth spot for that final playoff bid or whatever it may be um but it it really kind of works its way out and, it, and it, it's fine so whether utah's at 14 or out of the poll or 10 it doesn't matter so uh, I mean, it, just to close this up, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but your your ballot has to be in before camp even starts. Yeah, so I had to have it so in. So what are we talking about? I mean, come on. Exactly. Yeah. So much has changed from that time that it's right, – yeah, Come on. It's, it is it's, what it is. And at that time, Cam Rising still seemed to be on progress. On, you know, progress <laughs> right, sure. Progress. Who knows? There you go. So uh, this week, you got an opportunity to talk to Craig Smith. Uh, he yeah. was one of the first coaches outside of you know Kyle Whittingham uh, from the University of Utah to actually that we were able to get to talk to. There's a few that we were trying to, but Craig's been the first one that we've been able to talk to. Yeah, uh, Just going to break down your conversation with him and, and kind of what happened. They obviously left the country in the Big – or the Pac-12 and come back to the country in the Big 12. Yeah. Yeah, no, you don't see that every day. So, you know, uh, uh, college basketball teams are allowed to take, you know, foreign tours once every, I think, five years. So, you know, Utah's – taking a college tour to Spain and they leave on the evening of July 25th and they get to Spain. And obviously, you know, during that trip, right, they're playing games, they're sightseeing, they're doing educational stuff, but back home, the realignment stuff is getting ramped up. And, you know, of course, Craig Smith has no control, even if they were in the United States in Salt Lake city, like he has no real control, but it was an interesting, um, interesting situation where like you really didn't have a lot of contact with, with anybody like you're eight hours ahead in Spain versus Salt Lake city. So, you know, uh, he, you know, he gave me a, you know, a, a little anecdote, like, you know, they, they were staying in Barcelona. They drove three hours to play a game. They drive back to Barcelona, they eat dinner and Craig's phone rings and it's Mark. And they have a conversation about what's going on. Mark didn't have or give like every last detail, but like he wanted to check in with his basketball coach, gave him a lowdown. Um, you know, trip ends, the team flies from Madrid to JFK. 
and they're on a connecting flight from JFK to Salt Lake City. And in the middle of the flight, right, they're over the United States and Utah's going to the Big 12. Like, that's how they found out. Like, they're in the air after a long day of travel, and that's how they found out. So, you know, that was a fun little, you know, anecdote about how they found out. But then, you know, you start getting into a bit of the nitty gritty and what this means for Craig and, you know, the work that has to get done. And Craig, kind of in the same voice as Kyle, when we asked Kyle about this, Craig was like, look, there's a season to play. Like, this is our roster. This is our schedule. We're a member of the Pac-12. We have a season to play. But unlike Kyle, Kyle was very Tunnel Vision Florida, thinking about talking about Florida. But Craig, to his credit, said, in the back of our minds, this is going to be a quick turnaround. Like, as soon as the season ends on March, whatever, you're done with the Pac-12. And you have to start preparing for the Big 12, uh, getting to know those programs, what makes those programs successful. Remember, the Big 12, you know, you could, you know, between the Big 10, the ACC, and the Big 12, those are the three best conferences in the country. The Big 12 is in that, you know, alpha tier one group. So, you know, you have to figure this out. What makes those teams tick? What makes them successful? What makes winning teams successful? How do they continue that winning? So. Um, what do they need to do to their roster to get on par and be competitive? So there's a lot going on there. Um, and look, again, this is all brand new, right? Craig doesn't have all these answers, but yeah, there are things that you're going to have to have to deal with. Um, what does his budget look like? Is he, you know, they're going to need a bigger budget if they really want to compete. Uh, is the basketball team, and this probably goes for Lynn Roberts too with the women's team, are they going to charter everywhere? Like the men's team, amazingly, doesn't charter everywhere now. They, you know, they fly commercial to the LA schools. They fly commercial to the uh, to the Oregon schools, I think. So that's crazy that you're in the Pac-12 and you're not chartering everywhere. So there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of things that need to be figured out. And your timeline is pretty short. Again, you're going to play this season. This is, and this goes for both basketball programs, both genders. You're going to play this season, and that's it for the Pac-12. And once it hits, you know, March 20th, March 25th, whenever your season ends, you got to be thinking Big 12, and you have to be dealing with these things. And uh, again, very early, but it was good to hear, you know, Craig at least admit it's like, yeah, like this is on our minds. Like they had a staff meeting on uh, on Tuesday, right? Today's Thursday. That they had a staff meeting on Tuesday, and one of the major bullet points as part of a staff meeting was reach out to who you know on big 12 staffs and get some intel and try to get some help. And just, we need to find the road forward, even though we have, even though we have a season to play. So um, interesting times for Craig, you know, he's stepping up a, stepping up a couple of weight classes here in a year from the PAC 12 to the big 12. Um, I'll be curious to see how this season, this particular season goes because you, you know, you could be a factor in the Pac-12. I'm not saying you're like a top third, top quarter, but you could finish this coming season. You could be in the top half of the Pac-12. Like, I like their roster. I like what Craig's done to address some needs out of the transfer portal, specifically with Cole Badgema. Um, I'll be curious to see how this season specifically plays out before, you know, you really start getting into the Big 12 stuff. Well, and, and, and kind of going back to one of the things you said, you know, is they, they have a little bit more – of a runway where they can be thinking about the big 12 right now. Uh, they're not, you know, their, their season isn't imminent. It's not happening this second. And obviously they've got summer workouts right. and they've got different things that, uh, that matter. And, you know, they can't take their eye off the pack 12 because the reality is, is it, it's a year round thing, right? They're, they're working on it and they're doing oh, that. Yeah. And, and obviously recruiting is a different beast and you now they're going to have to focus on it that way. Like we mentioned with football. Um, but I think this gives them an opportunity to kind of look at the season with a different eye than maybe they were, would have had before. Uh, obviously, they're familiar with TS or TCU because they they've played them the last uh, two years, I believe. Um, yep. And so it's you know you they've got some level of of understanding what it is. And 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 TCU has been a good team, but they haven't been that upper echelon team yet. They're they're kind of hanging on that fringe. Um, but now you're getting Kansas, you're getting Baylor, you're getting Iowa State, you're getting West Virginia. These teams, they're all good, right? Like in Ken Palm, all of them are in the top eighty. Uh, the the two bottom ones are Utah yeah. and BYU. Utah's at 75 and BYU is at 77 last year. So, you know, two newcomers, BYU is going to find it out this year. Utah is going to find it out next year. It's it's going to be tough. 
Um, it'll be an interesting. That's debate. with Arizona. Arizona's it's, going to the Big Twelve too, exactly. so it's not like you're like it's not like you're losing Arizona. They're coming with you. Like, <laughs> they're good. I mean, and Colorado for that point, right? Colorado's been yeah. a good team. Arizona State with Bobby Hurley, he's he's always right. kind of in the middle of it. So this is not a conference to sleep on. Um, obviously, they were a great conference before. You get these four new teams, and you could argue three of the four were uh, at least more competitive. Utah being the one not as competitive, um, but I think you know. Craig is doing the things to get there. Will he run out of time? I don't know. And I, you know, we can debate that as the basketball season gets closer, but um, it, it is an interesting dynamic to, to be able to, to watch. This is a, another thing for like down the road, but we're talking about it. This is year three of a six year deal for Craig. Mm-hmm. The buyout pretty sure. I don't have it in front of me. I'm pretty sure the buyout goes like way down after this year. I believe so. If you're if you're Mark, do you have to extend Craig going into the Big Twelve just as a show of uh, of good faith that like he's the guy to lead us into this new era? And look, it's going to get tougher. It's going to get tougher for Craig. The roster, which look they've spent two, three, uh, two, off, uh, three off se- two off seasons cultivating this roster to what they believe they needed for the Pac-12, but they're going to have to kind of dive in again because what they have now you're probably going to have to remake it a little bit again Mm -hmm. to get yourself ready for the big 12 i wonder if if they go back to the table halfway through a six-year deal and and come up with something more or something else just because the you know the job that craig is being asked to do is let's look it's radically shifting it's going to get a little harder yeah and 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 i would you know you posed that question and, you know, we didn't talk about this beforehand. And and I think those are good things to be able to have because I feel like it, it gives me the raw emotions of it. I, you know, I initially, I wanted to say that he has to finish in the top half of the conference for that type of deal to give him that uh, opportunity to say, okay, we have faith in you going into the big 12, because if you can't even finish in the top half of the pac 12 this year, after year three of coming in that, that to me feels I don't feel like it's fireable, right? But I, I don't know that that gives you the confidence to say, hey, you know, we're, we're going to go into the Big 12 and, and just be this immediate, you know, boost. Nobody's expecting them to be. Yeah. But I, but then on the same side, you know, you, you bring up the, the impossible task that, that he's been given, right? Like the transfer portal, yes, it works, but it works differently in the basketball realm. Football, you can get guys, lose guys, whatever, and you can kind of relatively make up for it in a better way. Basketball is completely different. And, and the reality was BYU, or BYU, sorry, Utah's basketball situation was in dire straits, right? Uh, Larry Kristoviak, he was, he was decent at recruiting, but he couldn't translate that onto the court. And by the time he left, there was just nothing available. And, and that's that's harsh, right? I'm not saying there was nothing available, but – it, it was a scenario where Craig came into an environment where he had to grow significantly at a time when the Pac-12 at least had some top upper echelon teams with Arizona, UCLA, USC that made it very difficult for him to be able to compete. So on yep. one hand, I feel like, you know, he, he hasn't gotten a fair shake and, and that's his job, right? He understands that he's got to come in there and, 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 and do everything to be able to keep his, his contract and everything but at the same time, there has to be something. There has to be something, a lifeline to be able to say, hey, we're, we're making progress. We're doing this. That when yeah. we get into the Big 12, we'll be okay. The, the Pac-12, <clears throat> the Pac-12 is not, is not super duper loaded this year. Like on paper, it's, it's, just, it's just not. You know, Arizona, USC, with or without Bronny. Um, Oregon's going to be Oregon, presumably. That hasn't happened in a couple of years. UCLA loses a ton. They've reloaded, but they're not going to be what they have been the last two or three years. Um, if I'm doing a preseason poll right now, I'm probably slotting Utah in at like eight just because there's no reason that they cannot get into the top six. Um, they were contending for it last year. I mean, up until the latter part of it, they they were close. Uh, look, the the schedule down the stretch was Murderer's Row. Yes. And then you lost Gabe Madsen. And you lost Raleigh Worcester for a few games. And they just didn't have the depth, especially with Madsen. They did not have the depth to overcome something like that. But, okay, you go out and you get Cole Badgema. 
you go out and you get Lawson Lovering. Uh, Davon Smith from Georgia Tech, we'll see, as I wrote about this morning on KSL.com, um, he needs a transfer waiver, and it's unlikely that Davon Smith gets that transfer waiver. Um, you know, you, obviously, you know, you trust Brandon Carlson, right? Fifth-year guy, uh, third year in, in Craig Smith's program. I remain bullish, uh, and I get killed for this a lot, but, like, I remain bullish. I mean, I don't think there's enough um, – I don't think there was enough appreciation for the mess that Craig inherit, <clears throat> inherited. Mm-hmm. You had your four best players walk out the door before you held a meeting, essentially. Yeah, and it's been kind of a, a a bit of a slog to get the roster where they wanted. Look, he's he's missed. He's missed on some guys. I think they could be doing, or they need to be doing more out of the transfer portal. Um, but I I remain bullish. Like I think I think this is the guy. He's been successful everywhere he's been. And this is now, you know, this is his roster now. Like the the um, the easy excuse where, it, you know, well, this was Larry's roster or these were Larry's guys. You've turned over the entire roster now, save for Brandon Carlson. But Brandon Carlson has now spent more time with Craig Smith than he has with Larry Kostowiak. OK, so this is this is Smith's roster. And the bottom line is you're running out of excuses. Like you have to start to get something done. And if you get something done this year, however you want to define that, right? Get to the NIT, which I still think would be a good accomplishment. Get to the NCAA tournament. Then what do you do with your contract going into the Big 12? Because, again, the job is going to get a lot harder. And this is – the job is going to get a lot harder. And remember, this was Mark Harlan's first major coaching hire since he's been here. He's kind of lived – I don't want to call it a charmed life, but look, he hasn't had to hire a football coach. Just hasn't had to hire or fire a football coach. Uh, he stuck with Lynn Roberts through a couple of lean years. Not his hire, but you know he extended her. Um, Craig Smith is Mark Harlan's guy. Yeah. So it has to work. As you're, it it has to work, and you have to give Craig. If you're Mark, you have to give Craig what he needs to succeed. And if that means more job security, so you can go out on the road and walk into a a parent's living room and tell them, okay, we're transitioning into the big 12. I'm the guy that's going to take care of your son. That's what Mark has to do. Yeah, no, and I agree. And I think that's a, that's a very valid point because it's, it's a scenario where you as an athletic director have to also give confidence to the rest of the people on staff. And, and that's not to say that Mark has to hit every single hire, right? Like, like you mentioned, Mark is kind of the only hire that, or uh, Craig is the only hire that Mark's had. It's your first major hire. Exactly. And so it's, it's, you know, it's, especially in men's basketball, that is still a high risk, you know, high reward type scenario. If you hit and you, you know, he, he played it safe. I would say by hiring Craig, he was a great guy up at Utah state did really well. There's riskier picks that he could have had. And, you know, I know you've had a lot of people coming in with DMs <laughs> at that time, but we'll, we'll save those. But yeah. I think, you know, this, this is something that he needs him to succeed. So I, I, I will, you know, concede that fact that he needs this as much as anybody outside of Craig needs it as much as anybody. Um, but I think, I think that's, that's a, a, an interesting spot to be in. So um, we'll, we'll obviously talk more basketball as, as the season draws near. Uh, we'll probably start getting September. Uh, we'll start getting some camp stuff and uh, as they ramp up to October and other stuff like that. So we'll talk there. But uh, one other thing that happened today is uh, the gymnastics program had a ribbon cutting ceremony yep. for their Dumpkey gymnastics center. Uh, this is, so they have the same facility, but they've added on, they've expanded it and, and renovated a lot of it to make yeah. it more of an upgrade. Um, this is a major project for a women's you know, team, right? You don't see that a lot in a lot of universities. Football is king, men's basketball is king. You might have other universities that, that you know, take care of the women. Um, but the reality is this is a men's world. It's shifting. We're seeing that, especially at Utah, where the, a lot of these women are winning at a higher level. There's Pac-12 championships. You know, Lynn Roberts was was kind of the first last year. Then it moved into softball, and you have gymnastics. Gymnastics is always consistent. But this was a major investment into women's athletics, and I think that goes a long way, you know, University wide, you, you've got a program that that does a phenomenal job. They're in the national championship every single year that it's been created. Now you're showing them that there's an investment there. How, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but in your eyes, how important it is is it for universities nowadays to invest in women's sports? It's huge. It's huge. Um, 
<clears throat> women's sports is, is is it's been growing for a long time and it's um it's not it's not peaking anytime soon i don't think and i think from a utah perspective utah has a uh kind of a rare perspective because of what the gymnastics program has been at at utah they've been a national power forever and as you've said they go to, you know they've been to the national championships uh, every year since its existence. Um, so this is a bit of a different deal at Utah in terms of women's sports, specifically because of gymnastics. And um, and it's good. You know, this the Duncan Gymnastics Center, that's something that has been uh, kind of like on the to-do list for for Mark for, for a while. I mean, I remember talking to Mark like early pandemic, right, when I was still pretty new here. We're talking like spring 2020. And we were talking about a lot of things and he was like, yeah, like we, you know, we need to get the gymnastics practice facility renovated. Like when it opened back in 99, like it was state of the art and a lot of schools were not investing, or at least the ones that had gymnastics were not investing heavily in gymnastics the way that Utah was back then. But, you know, other schools, uh, schools caught up and it was time for Utah to, again, level up and look, um, one, you know, one mark of a, of a competent, successful athletic director is the ability to, well, twofold, one, raise money, and two, get things built when they need to be built. Um, if I remember correctly, I, I think the price tag on this originally was like, I think it was like 3 million or 3.2. And mm-hmm. then at some point it jumped up. I think it, you know, finally they got it done for like 4.6 million and they were able to raise that money. Uh, yeah, all I think, of it is, I think all of it is donor. There's no, all no of it is donor. Risk. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, good job by Mark, good job by the donors to get that done. Because, again, you have this type of success in a women's sport. You need to keep investing in said women's sport so you can continue to see, you know, the fruits of that labor. So, um, you know, good, you know, good day for Utah. It's always a good day for for the higher ups and for the people in charge when, you know, not not only can you get something built, but when you can complete it and you can have a ceremony and the ribbon cutting. So, you know, good for everybody involved. Yeah. It, it, it's, you know, if you're looking at it, it feels like a relatively minor thing, you know, you're cutting a ribbon for another building. Um, but it, it has huge ramifications for all women's sports. Um, you know, Lynn Roberts and in, in the women's basketball team, they obviously have a facility, they share it with the men. Um, so, I mean, there, there is aspects to that, but this is a dedicated opportunity to, you know, showcase the women in, in the, the athletic department, and so it's a it's a great uh, you know, opportunity for them to continue. So, um, well, let's let's wrap up today. We've 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 talked on a lot of things, and uh, we yeah. will obviously have more. But uh, next week, we're hoping to talk to a Florida beat writer, so we'll kind of get their perspective as we kind of start yeah. shifting into more game mode. Um, so we'll do that again next week, um, and then once the season starts, so the week of the season, we'll probably shift up the schedule a little bit uh, to try to to make this work. We'll we'll talk about the logistics of that. Um, but we're, we're excited to be able to move forward and talk actual football, talk to people about the game. Uh, we can actually you know, break down the game a little bit instead of, uh, you and I just, you know, talking about Bryson Barnes and cam rising and everything. <laughs> we'll still be talking about them, but at least with uh, game film or different things that way. So, there you go. Uh, and then also uh, just before we leave, I, I want to get everybody to remember the KSL.com sports pick them is live. Uh, you're welcome to start signing up for that. So go to KSL.com. Sign up for Pick'em. Uh, if you haven't done it before, we pick five games uh, each week. That's typically the three local games, unless one of the local teams has a bye that week. Um, and then we pick two national games of, of relative importance or regional importance uh, that you get to pick the score. Um, at the end of the week, you get to win gift cards if you're in the top three. So uh, there's a lot of fun with this. You know, Share it with your friends, your family, create groups, and do everything that you can to uh, uh, just you know, try to win. It's bragging rights. You get opportunities each week and then you have something at the end of the season. And uh, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. Yeah. We're going to throw Josh in there if he wants to this year. We'll see. What we're going to do it. Okay. Um, good uh, yeah, that's right. Um, but with that, you know, I'm done. Anything else, Josh, that you have before we want to leave? No, you know, we're getting uh, closer here uh, two weeks from the opener. And the next time we talk to you, I don't think we're going to have, I don't think we're going to have a QB announced. Mm-mm. But I'm I'm hoping that we have a little more clarity about what's going to go on on the 31st. Hopefully, the next time we talk to you guys next week. Yeah, we should hopefully have a little bit more info. Kyle should at least give us a little bit more to kind of get there. Maybe we'll have a depth chart by the time we talk. We'll see. Uh, yeah, 
we'll, it'll be curious to see if if we get that. But uh, thanks for listening to us. Uh, we appreciate all the the people that subscribe to this podcast and listen to us each week. Uh, you know, if you have any questions or anything that you want to talk to us about, shoot us a you know a DM and Twitter. Hit us up wherever you feel like. Email us, whatever it may be. Um, but we appreciate any questions and and comments that you may have. But uh, for both Josh's, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll tune, we'll talk to you guys next week. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.